Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Blood Academy's free monthly webinar broadcast over Zoom and YouTube Live. My name is Dr. Ali Mardi. I'm a consultant hematologist based in South Wales in the UK and also co-founder of the e-learning website Blood Academy. I'm delighted to uh, be joined today by uh, Dr. Stefan Jeftik from uh, McMaster University in Canada, uh, who will be going through all you need to know about uh, COVID-19 related thrombosis a virus and an infection that's caused all sorts of problems uh, in our lives over the past couple of years. Uh, so really great to have Stefan um, on the webinar today. But before we start the webinar, I'm just going to make some uh, brief announcements about some upcoming uh, courses with regards to Blood Academy and what we're about as well. So uh, Blood Academy, for those who don't know, we're an online educational platform aimed at a range of people, including hematologists, pathologists and scientists. We run various uh, online courses and we have resources for postgraduate examinations, uh, such as the FRC PATH in the UK. Uh, we publish a monthly interactive morphology case and we have a whole range of other things. And if you're not following us already on social media, then feel free to. Uh, we uh, post a huge range of education content every week. Uh, and if you're, um, train if you're in charge of training in your laboratory, especially with regards to blood cell morphology, and we have a range of packages uh, which uh, would be suitable for laboratory and clinical training in blood cell morphology. Uh, two exciting courses that we have coming up. The first one is our advanced hemostasis and thrombosis course. This is our first ever course uh, aimed at people sitting various exams, including the uh, uh, Royal College of Pathology exams in the UK. Uh, it's being run by three very experienced hematologists and uh, Royal College tutors. Uh, and we're really excited to bring this on the 9th and 10th of September, uh, where hopefully we're going to be discussing some of the things that uh, are going to be mentioned in today's webinar as well. So feel free to check that out. That is uh, all the details are on our website. Uh, and then we have our uh, advanced morphology course, which I'll be running. Um, I ran the course in March this year. Uh, it was uh, well attended and uh, the feedback gen uh, was uh, universally very positive. Uh, we have a whole range of different interactive cases. We'll go through 32 cases. Um, and there's a whole range of things to uh, discuss, especially with the update uh, with regards to WHO and also the ICC criteria. Uh, so feel free to uh, have a look on our website for this course, which I'm running online uh, on the 26th and 27th of September. So there's still plenty of time to register. OK, so just as a reminder that if you are a subscriber to Blood Academy, then this webinar is also linked to a CME certificate. Uh, the recording will be available on YouTube, uh, but also available on the website. Uh, and subscribers have access to a mini assessment uh, linked to a uh, certificate of participation uh, with regards to this webinar as well. OK, so let's move on to today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Stefan Jevtik. Uh, who obtained his medical degree from McMaster University in Canada, uh, where he's also currently training in internal medicine. Uh, he's active in, in research, uh, and his current research interests include platelet activation disorders, uh, with a particular focus on uh, anti-PF4 syndromes and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, and I think there's a good relation when it comes to COVID-19 infection on that topic as well. So, uh, welcome, Stefan. Uh, just as a reminder for everyone, um, if you do have any questions, then feel free to write this in the chat on Zoom or use it on the uh, use the chat function on YouTube. Uh, and at the end of um, uh, Stefan's presentation, uh, we'll go through them. So um, I'll leave uh, I'll leave you now with Stefan. If I could just make you uh, the host, you should be able to show your screens then. Perfect. Um, okay. Everyone see that okay and hear me? Yeah, we can see it very well. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today with you and to discuss uh, COVID-19 coagulopathy uh, and also focus on uh, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia for a bit. Um, I'm hoping this will serve as a broad level summary of these two topics and really uh, help to give some clinical pearls about how to maybe differentiate these two in the clinical setting and what really underlies the uh, differences from a pathobiology perspective. So I have no financial conflicts to disclose. 
And really today I'm hoping to start with a case uh, just to highlight the complexity of these two presentations in the clinical setting. Uh, then we'll review COVID-19 related coagulopathy, which is a unique viral infection associated entity, uh, how it presents and what we know so far about its management. Um, and then we'll move into vaccine induced immune thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenia, which is a separate unrelated uh, entity to COVID-19 infection, but has been uh, linked to adenovirus uh, vaccine uh, uh, related events. And finally, we'll summarize both of these and return to our case. Um, just a quick note that a lot of the studies we'll be discussing today in COVID-19 were published very early on during the pandemic. Uh, with the initial wave, as well as with the Delta wave. And so uh, we have seen multiple changes, both in clinical presentation and thrombotic rates, as um, we've had increasing vaccination rates and virus mutations. So some of the epidemiology we discuss may not hold as true today, but it still highlights uh, this unique disorder. All right, uh, and feel free to interrupt at any time. So we'll start with our case. Uh, we have a 52-year-old male who's presenting to hospital in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic with hypoxic respiratory failure and an altered level of consciousness. He's initially intubated and transferred to the ICU with a CTPE confirming of pulmonary embolism. On initial CT head, there is no evidence of any acute ischemic infarcts, but there is evidence of bilateral parenchymal hemorrhaging and a question of cerebral venous sinus involvement. A follow-up MRI venogram confirmed CVST. On initial investigations, uh, you find an elevated D-dimer at 3,000 uh, fibrinogen equivalent units, hypofibrinogenemia of 0.8, and thrombocytopenia at 30. The question then is, what are your next steps for diagnosis, and how would you manage this patient? All right. So just to briefly review COVID-19 itself, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, it's caused by the severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome virus, or SARS-CoV-2. And it primarily manifests as a respiratory disease. But early on in the pandemic, what we really saw was a high degree of thrombotic events in these patients who presented to hospital, particularly of both venous and arterial origin, which is quite unique. Um, this included DVT and PE, but also uh, evidence of myocardial infarction, stroke, and even limb ischemia. And so what we know is that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, generally enters the respiratory tract uh, and is able to bind to the ACE receptor on uh, alveolar epithelial cells. In patients who have a milder infection, um, generally you have a very limited immune response. And so your alveolar macrophages and your resident dendritic cells are able to secrete antiviral uh, cytokines such as type 1 and type 3 interferon, which really limit the virus's replication and activation. Uh, and although we have mild activation of macrophages and neutrophils, it's uh, a very subdued response compared to what we see in critically ill COVID-19 patients. And what we learned very early on in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was that this excess immune response was really what appeared to trigger such an acute uh, presentation. And so instead of having a very well-regulated uh, response, you have excess neutrophil activation leading to natosis and formation of reactive oxygen species. You have excess cytokine secretion leading to what's called a cytokine storm. And this really serves not only to uh, cause intense immune cell activation, but also damage to surrounding tissue. And so we saw that with fibrin deposition and destruction of the alveolar uh, walls, as well as activation of endothelial cells and other uh, immune cells, such as uh, neutrophils and platelets. And so all this to say that what we noticed was that uh, there was quite an increase in the events of venous thrombotic events in these critically ill patients. Uh, the studies were quite variable in uh, the exact incidence, but it ranged anywhere from 20 to 65% of critically ill patients having evidence of a VTE. Generally, the studies that showed a higher incidence rate were those that employed screening techniques like a screening ultrasound, which we know is not generally advised in the clinical setting. Uh, there was a meta-analysis, including 66 studies, that showed a, uh, an estimate of about 14% VTE. Um, and we know that from general hospitalized internal medicine patients, the rate of thrombotic events is about 0.5%. So this is quite an uh, increase in incidence uh, with COVID-19 patients. 
What we also saw was that a lot of these patients uh, had arterial events about three to four percent. Uh, and generally this occurred in those with additional comorbidities uh, such as uh, underlying cardiovascular disease or metabolic abnormalities. And this is just a nice figure uh, from a study in The Lancet looking at uh, various databases in Europe. Uh, and this is from, I believe, a Spanish database of hospitalized patients. And what we see is that not only is there this increased incidence of uh, VTE and arterial thrombosis, but it's very uh, related to age. And so in uh, males and females over 65, this represents the highest risk group uh, for having such events and of course, associated mortality with that. Uh, the evidence for prothrombotic phenotype was also seen clinically in these patients. So when they presented, they often had an elevated D-dimer uh, in hospital, generally greater than two times the upper limit of normal. Um, and many studies actually showed that you could risk stratify patients based on the, the degree of D-dimer elevation. Uh, and this portended a poorer prognosis, uh, the higher the degree of elevation. We also saw that these patients had increased von Willebrand factor circulating, um, as well as increased fibrinogen, again, suggesting that hyperinflammatory state. Many also presented with a mild thrombocytopenia, uh, reduced ADMTS13 levels, as well as reduced prothrombin and antithrombin. And altogether, these really pointed to a prothrombotic disorder uh, related to the COVID-19 infection that goes above and beyond any uh, regular uh, viral infection. And so the three main uh, mechanisms that we understand today related to COVID-19 coagulopathy include this hyperinflammation, endothelial cell activation, and platelet cell activation. And so we'll go uh, through just a few of these uh, today. So starting with the hyperinflammation. Uh, one component of the innate immune system is obviously uh, neutrophils who are generally first line responders to any pathogen infection. Uh, and neutrophils are quite unique in that they can undergo a process called netosis, uh, which stands for neutrophil extracellular trap formation. This is a very regulated form of apoptosis that involves decondensed chromatin and histones uh, that are released from the neutrophil. Uh, and they not only serve to physically trap microbes and pathogens, but also contain uh, bactericidal uh, and other uh, antimicrobial uh, proteins on their surface. Uh, unfortunately, this can contribute to thrombosis, uh, both through activating platelets and some studies have even suggested uh, releasing tissue factor uh, during this process. And so again, uh, early studies uh, in hospitalized patients, this is a cohort of 33 COVID-19 patients. Uh, and what the researchers did is they looked at the formation of myeloperoxidase DNA complexes in uh, circulation, which are a marker of natosis. And in those who were admitted to hospital, there was a significant increase in the circulating marker compared to healthy controls. Um, and particularly in those who were admitted to the ICU or required intubation. Uh, this was not seen in convalescent COVID-19 patients, uh, suggesting that it's the acute uh, phase of the reaction. And they also looked at the level of circulating platelet and neutrophil complexes because, again, these netoses can uh, serve to activate and attract platelets. Uh, and again, they found that in the hospitalized COVID-19 patients, there was a significant increase in uh, these aggregates. Uh, they confirmed that on uh, three patients in autopsy, there was evidence of pulmonary microthrombi as well, tying this link that neutrophils can activate uh, to form these microclots in circulation. And these uh, findings were all confirmed in a subsequent study of 50 hospitalized patients, again, uh, in the early waves of the pandemic. So we have not really seen newer studies uh, investigating this. Another key component of the innate immune system is the complement system. Uh, and so this is an evolutionarily conserved uh, system that relies on protein activation to uh, eventually form what's known as a MAC attack complex that's able to either opsonize pathogens or uh, directly cause uh, lysis of the pathogen. And there are three main ways uh, that we can activate the complement pathway regularly. Um, one is a classical uh, immune pathway. So if you can see here, uh, it's primarily triggered by immune complex activation and C1Q protein. There's a lectin pathway, which involves mannose binding lectin. 
Uh, and both of these pathways ultimately lead to activation of what's known as a complement three or C3 protein. Uh, and this triggers the rest of the cascade, ultimately leading to C5 to C9. Uh, and lastly, we have the alternative pathway. And this is an interesting pathway in that it's a spontaneous hydrolysis of the C3 protein leading to formation of uh, its components. And generally this is regulated by inhibitory factors such as factor H that uh, prevent this from occurring in the absence of an inflammatory signal. And as you can likely imagine, COVID has been shown to activate uh, all three of these pathways uh, in various uh, studies again, supporting that hyperinflammatory state. And so in uh, a small cohort of COVID-19 patients, it was shown that circulating levels of the C4D protein or complement 4D um, was elevated compared to controls. And this is in relation to the classical pathway, suggesting that spike-specific antibodies uh, may uh, activate the classical pathway um, of complement. Again, that's fairly indirect evidence, but it, it does, raise the question as to whether spike-dependent uh, antibodies can have an immune uh, hyperactivation role. The SARS-CoV-2 virus can also directly bind to the mannose binding lectin through its uh, proteins to activate the lectin-based pathway. Uh, and finally, uh, the virus can also bind to heparin sulfate that's exposed on cells. Um, and in doing so, it can inhibit factor H, which is an inhibitor of complement. And so through the double negative, it's actually promoting uh, activation of the alternative complement pathway. This is a very complex figure, but uh, really, as you can see, there are many different uh, therapeutics that have been developed to inhibit various aspects of the complement cascade, including uh, complement-directed antibodies. Um, there have been several clinical trials, generally small and underpowered, that have failed to really show any clinical benefit. Um, but it would really take a larger uh, based trial to, I think, investigate for any true effect. As you can see here, uh, the complement cascade can also ultimately lead to formation of mitosis, as we've discussed previously, and platelet activation, which is how it's related to the formation of uh, thrombi in COVID-19. So the next uh, pathway we'll discuss is endothelial cell activation. Um, and we'll just begin with a brief review of general endothelial cell physiology. Um, and so, as you know, uh, Endothelial cells generally regulate vascular tone and permeability as their main role, um, but they've also been shown to regulate uh, megakaryocyte development in the bone marrow as well as platelet cell uh, maturation through various um, factor signaling uh, and trophogens. They're also the main synthesizers and uh, regulators of von Willebrand factor in the body uh, and have also been implicated in the immune system via toll-like receptors. So the role for endothelial cells uh, was quite prominent again early in the pandemic uh, when it was shown that there was increased von Willebrand factor expressed in these patients. Uh, and on autopsy, what we could see is that when you looked in the lung and the heart uh, in control, this is von Willebrand factor staining in pink. Um, there's generally baseline uh, staining present in endothelial cells. But with COVID-19 infection, you have been a uh, marked increase in the staining and release of this factor, suggesting uh, marked endothelial cell activation. Uh, and just to briefly review our von Willebrand factor physiology, as we know, uh, von Willebrand factor is housed in endothelial cells as an ultra-large multimer. Uh, once it's released, it's often quickly cleaved by Adam TS13 to prevent its prothrombotic uh, state to activate platelets and cause aggregation. But if uncleaved, it, it's quite potent in um, triggering this thrombus formation and associated coagulopathy. Um, we've seen this in TTP, and interestingly, several studies have shown that in COVID-19 patients, not only do you have increased uh, multimers of von Willebrand factor, but you also have a moderately reduced level of ADAMTS13 activity. It's generally not as severe as what we would see in a TTP case where it's a less than 10%, but generally hovering around the 30 to 50% mark, suggesting there's some uh, uh, reduction with COVID-19 infection. How that happens, it's not quite sure, um, but I'm sure there are studies underway currently investigating that. And lastly, we'll focus on platelet cell activation um, because this is uh, seen quite uh, a number of studies published in this regard for COVID-19. 
And again, uh, platelets are not only related to uh, thrombosis, but also have been shown to have uh, various immune roles, both through secreting inflammatory cytokines like interleukin 1 beta, um, but also through opsonization of bacteria and various pathogens. And really, this is mediated through their uh, cell surface receptors. And the one we'll be focusing on today will be the FC gamma R2A receptor, uh, which is known to bind to immunoglobulin of the IgG family. And so uh, this was uh, a large study of over 100 COVID-19 patients, again, uh, during the initial wave of the pandemic. Uh, and what it showed was that uh, uh, platelets from COVID-19 patients secreted increased levels of inflammatory cytokines and soluble CD4 ligand when uh, triggered with a stimulus such as thrombin, as you can see here. Um, other studies confirmed that markers of platelet activation, such as P-selectin and CD63, were also significantly elevated in critically ill patients. Um, and when genetic studies were done to investigate transcriptional changes, uh, there was evidence of increased uh, markers of platelet cell activation as well, really highlighting that COVID-19 triggers this pro-inflammatory uh, hyperactivated platelet phenotype. How exactly this occurs is not quite clear. Um, some studies have hypothesized that there's potentially direct viral infection of the platelets, but this has not been proven yet in vitro. But another interesting concept is the potential of antibody-mediated platelet cell activation. And so as we discussed, uh, the FC gamma receptor 2A on platelet surfaces is able to bind to various immunoglobulins um, and through this can activate the platelet into a prothrombotic phenotype. And so uh, when you take serum from critically ill COVID-19 patients, it's able to increase uh, platelet apoptosis in vitro through uh, activation. And this is mediated through this FC receptor 2A. Um, when we add an inhibitor such as 4.3, this reaction uh, is blocked, uh, thus confirming it's IgG related. Uh, similarly, if you take the IgG fraction alone from COVID-19 patients, um, there is some evidence that this can promote thrombus formation uh, in animal models. And so what is this antibody that's able to activate platelets? Again, it's not quite clear. Um, some have hypothesized that antivoxolipid antibodies may be the culprit. Uh, the initial reports from COVID-19 patients showed that up to 50% could have uh, evidence of an antivoxolipid antibody, either lupus anticoagulant or beta-2 glycoprotein or cardiolipin. However, we know that viral infections can commonly trigger transient uh, APLAs, and it's not clear if these are truly functional. Uh, in one study, uh, published in Science uh, two years ago, uh, they looked and found that in their patient samples from COVID-19, if they took the IgG fraction and differentiated their cohort between those with high titer and low titer uh, antiphospholipid antibodies, there was a slight trend towards increased thrombus formation uh, when the serum was injected into a mouse model compared to those with a lower titer. And interestingly, uh, the degree of thrombus formation was higher compared to catastrophic antiphospholipid uh, antibody patients and certainly higher than their control patients. That being said, uh, the IgG fraction is not specific for antiphospholipid antibodies and so any uh, other specific antibody could be related to this reaction, uh, including the spike dependent COVID-19 antibodies. Um, so it's quite unclear uh, what antibody is a culprit, but it does highlight that uh, something in the immunoglobulin fraction is contributing to this platelet cell activation. And so in terms of management for COVID-19 coagulopathy, there have not been uh, many targeted therapies developed. Uh, generally, it involves supportive management for the COVID-19 infection itself and really targeting that hyperinflammatory state with dexamethasone, remdesivir, tocilizumab, and many of the other validated therapies that we have. Uh, there were uh, several large studies investigating the use of therapeutic anticoagulation uh, with heparin in uh, COVID-19 patients. These were published in the New England Journal last year. Um, and what they showed was that in uh, hospitalized patients who were non-critically ill, there was potentially some benefit from therapeutic anticoagulation and that it reduced or it, sorry, it increased the survival uh, from hospital with organ-free support days. 
However, in critically ill COVID-19 patients, there was a trend towards increased bleeding and no evidence of benefit. And so this suggests that uh, increasing from prophylactic dose anticoagulation to intermediate or therapeutic might have benefit in those with a milder COVID-19 infection. However, this has not really taken a great clinical hold. Um, again, secondary to mutations in the virus and uh, increased vaccination uh, internationally. Um, it's unclear whether this is still beneficial in these mild COVID-19 cases. So that's currently our understanding of COVID-19 coagulopathy. Um, just to summarize, the highest risk patients appear to be those who are critically ill, admitted to the ICU or requiring organ uh, support. Uh, and we can risk stratify them based on their age and their D-dimer level. The three main mechanisms appear to be hyperinflammation from netosis and neutrophil activation, as well as complement, endothelial cell activation involving the von Willebrand factor and Adam TS13 access, and finally, platelet cell activation, uh, including hyperactivated platelets and a potential immune complex mediated activation. Uh, management is generally supportive with COVID 19 specific treatments and potentially a role for therapeutic anticoagulation uh, empirically in non critically ill patients. This is a nice figure um, by Conway et al. that was recently published in Nature Reviews. Um, and it really just highlights all of these factors from the initial viral infection to how it uh, leads to a hyperactive innate immune response, uh, as well as the relationship to thrombosis and endothelial cell activation. So I'd highly recommend uh, that review if interested. And before we finish off this topic, I uh, just wanted to discuss a proposed definition of COVID-19 coagulopathy. Um, again, it's a very non-specific uh, prothrombotic state. So there's no one diagnostic test, um, but this was uh, an initial proposed definition by Iba et al. Um, during the initial uh, waves of COVID-19. Um, and really looking at these factors such as thrombocytopenia, elevated D-dimer, and evidence of macro microthrombosis. And using this uh, in conjunction with other findings such as fibrinogen and increased von Willebrand factor to really uh, confirm the diagnosis of coagulopathy. Okay. So now if there's any questions or comments, please feel free to interrupt, but we'll move on to vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia or VIT. And this is a separate prothrombotic disorder. So it's unrelated to COVID-19 infection, um, but is associated with COVID-19 vaccination. And so as many of you know, I'm sure uh, this was discovered initially during the mass vaccination campaigns with uh, adenovirus COVID-19 vaccines, uh, particularly AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting presentation as it initially presented a hospital with uh, severe thrombocytopenia, catastrophic thrombotic events, and very much like a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT type reaction. And so um, really that's what facilitated our understanding of it and what's led to our quick uh, understanding of diagnosis and management. So this is a nice uh, figure summary here showing uh, an adenovirus vaccine. And when a patient is exposed to this for reasons that are still being understood, um, certain patients develop a prothrombotic antibody against uh, platelet factor four. Uh, this can then activate platelets and lead uh, to this procoagulant state that we'll discuss shortly. And so just to quickly differentiate, VIT is really on a spectrum of what we might call anti-PF4 syndromes, which include other conditions such as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia uh, or HIT, autoimmune HIT, and spontaneous HIT. The key uh, feature between all of these conditions is that they present with thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, often concurrently, um, but sometimes with uh, delayed starts. And one way to help differentiate these is that um, they have unique presenting features. And so autoimmune HIT, unlike classic HIT, may have a more prolonged course. It may be associated with bond of paranox as opposed to a heparin product, um, and also may have a more severe DIC type picture. Spontaneous HIT and VIT uh, are unique in that they can present in unusual sites of thrombosis, including splanchnic and CVST um, 
And the patient population is also uh, a key differentiating factor between these disorders. So as we've discussed, VIT is commonly seen post adenoviral vaccination. Spontaneous HIT is uniquely associated with uh, total knee arthroplasty and orthopedic surgery, as well as potentially viral infection. Um, and then HIT is uh, also associated generally post cardiac surgery or with exposure to unfractionated IV heparin. And autoimmune HIT is really very variable, and so it should always be on the back of your mind when you have uh, this type of presentation in a clinical patient. The culprit uh, is platelet factor four, as we've discussed. Um, this is the antigen target for all of these syndromes. Um, as you know, it's a chemokine that's housed in platelets in the alpha granules and is secreted uh, with activation, as well as uh, by stimuli such as surgery and infection. And its exact roles are unclear, but it appears to have uh, roles to inhibit platelet cell maturation as well as angiogenesis. This is a very nice figure. Um, from a New England Journal paper by Greinecker uh, many years ago, uh, really showing uh, how when you have bacteria or potentially some infection uh, or a surgical trigger, you can have this platelet factor four release. Uh, and in the body, it can bind to naturally forming heparin complexes or to exogenously uh, administered heparin. Uh, and this can lead to the antigen complex formation uh, required for an anti-PF4 syndrome. So again, that pathophysiology is primarily based on platelet activating antibodies. Um, and these are able to bind platelet factor four either by itself or when it's complex to heparin or some other scaffold. Uh, and once these pathogenic antibodies bind, they're able to form complexes leading to platelet cell activation and activation through that FC gamma receptor 2A. The unique thing about VIT, as opposed to the other anti-PF4 syndromes, is that it does not require heparin at all uh, for its function. And this is a really elegant study um, published actually from McMaster, uh, Wynn at Allen Nature. And this is the PF4 molecule, as you can see. Um, and what they did was they used a technique called alanine scanning mutagenesis, where uh, they mutated uh, subsequent amino acids in the platelet factor four molecule to identify where exactly the pathogenic antibodies bind to. And so what you can see here in uh, classic HIT samples, what you have is uh, binding to this blue highlighted region on the PF4 molecule. And this is the HIT dependent region. And um, normally what you have is heparin will bind to this purple region here, and that will facilitate antibody binding in this blue region. Interestingly, some HIT patients who may present with more autoimmune type features or spontaneous HIT will also have binding of antibodies directly into this heparin groove. And so these heparin groove binding antibodies uh, will actually compete with heparin for this binding site and so do not need heparin in order to activate platelets. And interestingly, that's exactly where VIT antibodies seem to bind to. They bind directly into this heparin binding groove on the platelet factor four molecule. And so in the presence of heparin, they actually compete uh, for this binding and so are inhibited by heparin as opposed to facilitated by it. Um, as with any anti 4 syndrome, there are two uh, diagnostic questions to answer. One, is there an antibody present? And two, does it activate platelets? And so there are several um, tests for uh, antibodies that we use. One are the enzyme immunoassays. Um, and as we know, they generally function by having uh, patient antibodies bind to a predefined antigen target, such as uh, platelet factor four conjugated with uh, polyvinyl sulfate or heparin. Once the patient serum is added with the hit antibodies, a secondary antibody, either with a fluorescent tag or a chemical tag is added, and then the absorbance is directly measured, which is proportional to the degree of pathogenic antibody in these samples. The other test that we have uh, is, are the rapid assays. And so these function somewhat differently. Um, what you have generally uh, is, again, your platelet factor four and heparin complex. And what you'll have in this example is a latex particle coated with the antibody. And so once the latex particle is present with the antigen, they will agglutinate and have increased absorbance, leading to reduced light transmission. 
Subsequently, if you add a patient serum or plasma with a hit antibody, it will compete with the latex particle for that platelet factor four complex. And in doing so, it'll inhibit the aggregation and allow increased light transmission. And so the degree of light transmission is directly uh, proportional to the degree of uh, hit antibody in the patient plasma. Interestingly, several studies have looked at comparing rapid assays to enzyme amino assays in VIT, and what they've shown is that rapid assays are quite poor in uh, identifying anti-PF4 antibodies. Um, so generally, the sensitivity is much less than 50%, and some are even lower than 10%. Uh, and so that's really led to the understanding that rapid assays should not be used in the context of VIT setting. And so if you have a patient who's suspected of it particularly, um, it's important to speak with your lab to understand what type of assay you use uh, and whether uh, an enzyme amino assay or a more uh, sensitive uh, assay is available. Generally, once uh, you've identified an antibody, if the clinical suspicion is high enough, uh, there's often no need to proceed to functional testing. But if there's any uh, question or for completeness sake, uh, you can proceed to a functional platelet assay. And the one we'll discuss here is a serotonin release assay, which is a gold standard. And the way this works is uh, platelet-rich plasma, generally from healthy donors, is incubated with a radioactive label, such as serotonin. Um, these platelets are then uh, added with heat-inactivated patient sera or plasma that contains a pathogenic antibody. And then uh, platelet activation and release of that radio-labeled serotonin is done in the absence and presence of heparin. In the case of VIT, uh, we've modified the assay to use platelet factor 4 because we know that that is actually the uh, prothrombotic antigen uh, in that condition. And generally what you'll see uh, in VIT patients, so this is the platelet activation, the percent release of serotonin. The cutoff is generally 20% for this assay. And so in a VIT patient, when you have buffer and no other stimulus, uh, there may be some degree of activation, but nothing uh, too remarkable. Heparin will actually inhibit the VIT reaction, again, because it competes for that binding site with the antibody, whereas platelet factor 4 will have a marked activation uh, in the serotonin release assay. Okay. Uh, and so one of the key uh, aspects of VIT is that anticoagulation is mandatory, and this is true of all the anti-PF4 syndromes, because they are so highly prothrombotic, um, anticoagulation is required to prevent uh, any thrombosis, um, even if the patient presents with thrombocytopenia initially. Um, the approved ones generally are ergatroban, which has been approved for HIT. Um, Fondaparinox, um, it's, it has a very low rate of cross-reactivity in uh, about one to 2%, I believe. Um, and so it's often still used if there's no suspicion of autoimmune HIT. And DOICs have in increasingly been shown to have benefit in HIT, uh, even in the acute phase, um, although the evidence is still accumulating for a bit. And so uh, generally these are not as favored uh, so far. The important thing to note about anticoagulation is that warfarin uh, is contraindicated in the acute uh, phase of VIT and any of the anti-PF4 syndromes. And the reason for this is that it can precipitate a DIC and procoagulant phenotype uh, due to the imbalance of your protein CNS with your other coagulation factors. Uh, and so although it can be used chronically after the acute phase of an anti-PF4 syndrome for long-term maintenance, it is generally contraindicated uh, acutely. And the second prong for management of VIT, uh, along with anticoagulation, is really immunosuppression, uh, because we know that uh, VIT is an antibody-mediated process. Um, steroids to help dampen that uh, antibody production uh, is necessary. Um, and if contraindicated, then intravenous immunoglobulin is recommended. There are multiple case reports and studies from autoimmune HIT that have shown IVIG can uh, improve the degree of um, platelet count uh, much more rapidly than anticoagulation alone. Um, and because of it is such a severe reaction, uh, IVIG is strongly recommended and has been shown to be beneficial. The mechanism is thought to be secondary to inhibiting that immune complex activation through the FC receptor, but also potentially through downregulation of B cells and that antibody production. All right. <clears throat> 
So just to summarize, VIT uh, as an anti-PFOR syndrome, it's a highly prothrombotic disorder. It's uniquely been associated with adenoviral vaccination, particularly with COVID-19. Um, diagnostic testing should include anti-PFOR enzyme immunoassays and should not include a rapid assay. Um, and platelet activation testing is also recommended, but not necessary. Management must include anticoagulation and immunosuppression with potential IVIG as necessary. And so back to our case, so we, as you recall, had a 52-year-old who had two thrombotic events identified, a CTPE as well as uh, CVST. Interestingly, he was found to have uh, hemorrhaging in the brain as well. Um, and he had evidence of a significant coagulopathy um, on his initial investigations. Um, oh, interesting. Um, and so the question is, how, what would you do for diagnosis and management? So I don't know if anyone would like to comment or share before we, we answer the case. I don't think we've had any comments uh, as yet, Stefan. Okay. So, perfect. So um, generally this, this patient, obviously it's hard to tell at this point, but given the atypical presence of a CVST uh, and multiple thrombi and severe thrombocytopenia, that's generally not what we see with COVID-19 related coagulopathy. It's usually milder thrombocytopenia unless they've gone into a DIC. And so an NTPF4 syndrome would probably be at the top of the differential. Um, and so uh, on additional history, actually you uncovered that they had received the AstraZeneca vaccine about three weeks ago. Their COVID-19 test is negative. Uh, and when you send for an anti p 4 amino assay, the optical density comes back at three, which is quite high. And there's evidence of strong platelet activation in the uh, p 4 enhanced SRA. So this is a case of VIT. Um, a key point, oh, sorry. Um, with VIT, although this patient does have hemorrhaging, uh, parenchymal hemorrhage, uh, as shown on his CT. Uh, the reason is likely because of venous congestion from the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And so even in these patients, if uh, VIT or an anti p 4 syndrome is confirmed, uh, anticoagulation is still recommended because it will actually improve that venous congestion and improve that flow um, to actually uh, help limit the bleeding. Uh, and, but obviously they should be in a monitored setting to make sure there's no neurologic deterioration. So thank you everyone for uh, attending today. It's been a pleasure um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I see there's one already pending um, and any discussion. Well, thank you, Stefan. That was really, really interesting. Um, a really good link between the, um, the, the mechanisms of thrombosis and, and VIT as well. So um, we do have one question um, which has come in. What happens if you give heparin to a VIT patient? I don't know if you have more, any comments on that. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, and so there's been no uh, in vivo studies really, uh, but a recently published study in blood uh, a few months ago now by Singh et al. Um, they looked in vitro at uh, various platelet activation studies. And what they showed was that heparin can inhibit uh, this immune complex reaction for VIT at various stages, both through the immune complex and directly with uh, the platelet activation. And so theoretically, uh, heparin may be used in VIT patients, um, but really it should be done cautiously because uh, it, it's hard to tell whether there's an overlap at this point between any of the P4 syndromes. Um, so if everything else is contraindicated or unavailable, uh, heparin may be the best option. Yeah. Um, one question from, from myself is, um, we have experience mostly of using our gatrovan in patients with HIT. Um, is there a specific anticoagulant that you use uh, initially and then transfer on to. Uh, so usually we go for our gatroban and then warfarin, although in some cases we have used the DOAC. For patients with VIT, um, is there any specific sequence of um, anticoagulants that you prefer to use? No, I've seen quite a variety. I mean, I think Fondaparinex has been used as well. Um, and so really, I, I don't think there's any one specific uh, answer, uh, really depending what's available and the patient preference. Yeah. You know. Excellent. Um, and we, in terms of the interpretation of the enzyme in, uh, immunoassay for the PF4, um, mm -hmm. optical density, I tend to try to use that in terms of the strength of reaction. Do, do we tend to see high optical densities in, in VIT patients as opposed to other anti-PF4 syndromes like HIT? 
Uh, is there a specific cutoff that you use, you know, with the, the, the notion that everything has to be lab specific, et cetera, and with, the, with your reagents that you use? Yeah, just anecdotally from the patients I've seen, generally VIT and even the spontaneous HIT patients who also have that unique anti-PF4 antibody, um, they, they do have a much stronger uh, enzyme immunoassay OD, generally up to 2.53 and sometimes higher. Um, again, it's more anecdotal than anything, but it does just reaffirm that kind of clinical suspicion when you see that. Yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting from that comment that the use of immunosuppressants are generally more favored in, in VIT as opposed to using HIT. I mean, I, I've n- never used any immunosuppression in a patient with HIT. It's just been anticoagulation and stopping the heparin. So uh, mm-hmm. really interesting. Um, I, I don't have any other questions or, or comments. So um, if it's okay with, with you, Stefan, we'll uh, uh, close things for, for today's webinar. I really want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, and thankfully, uh, our, our lives are a little bit better now that with, the, with the vaccines and everything. Yes. Uh, so real big thank you to, uh, to you, Stefan, for uh, a great webinar and presentation. Uh, thank you for everyone who's joined us on the uh, the Zoom call today. Um, there is a short survey that I'll post in the chat. And if you could uh, fill that out, that would be great. It'll only take a minute of your time. Uh, and um, the next webinar, we're having a, a small break uh, for September, uh, but I'll be doing a webinar uh, discussing uh, all the changes that have happened uh, from uh, the WHO and the ICC with regards to acute myeloid leukemia, and a look back at history about the uh, the blast cell and uh, wh- where we've got to at the moment. And that will be on the 17th of October at 3 p.m. UK time. Uh, so uh, it just leaves me to say thank you again to you, Stefan, for a great webinar, and hopefully we'll see you guys soon uh, for our next webinar on the 17th of October. Thank you, everyone. Excellent.